Hello, this is David welcoming you to another Historic Decisions podcast from D&D History Hub. Now, a viewer from North Yorkshire, Matt, has asked me, why did Tostig Godwinson decide to betray his brother and king, Harold Godwinson, by siding with the Viking Harold Hardrada, leading up to that fateful Battle of Stamford Bridge on September 25th, 1066. I think it's a, a, a great question, and it takes us to the heart of the fate, not just of Tostig and his brother King Harold, but also um, of the Anglo-Saxon people. Their lives changed forever after 1066. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the Stafford Bridge battle, uh, nor uh, Tostig and Hadrada's raids and incursions leading up to it. But as we know, um, Harold and his army triumphed at Stamford Bridge, not far from the city of York, after an epic march up from south, up from the south of England, where he'd been waiting for the, uh, the Norman invasion. Both Tostig and Hadrada were killed. However, Harold, the Saxon king, then had to quickly march south to fight the Normans at the Battle of Hastings on October 14th, 1066. Harold and his wearied army were defeated. But would they have been had his brother Tostig not gone rogue? Well, we don't know, but it certainly would have improved Harold's chances, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Now, at first glance, Tostig's actions seem to be the work of a dangerous and perhaps deranged villain motivated by resentment and greed. Uh, in one view, he was guilty of breaching contemporary social norms by ignoring or rejecting the heroic codes we see reflected in old English and Saxon literature. Um, just th think of the likes of uh, Beowulf, uh, the Wanderer, the Seafarer, um, the Battle of Maldon, with their meditations on courage, bravery, renown and, and loyalty, and especially commitment to their clan and especially their leader. He who can should achieve renown before death. That is the best memorial when life is past and a warrior's days are recounted, uh, says Beowulf, who also declares, In the time I was given, I lived in my own land, ruling my people well, never turning to treachery or swearing to oaths contrary to right. Now we can see these Anglo-Saxon codes reenacted, if you like, in, in modern literature in, and film. Think, for example, of the depiction of the fictional uh, writers of uh, Rowan in J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, The Lord of the Rings. Um, I'm talking, among other things, was a, a professor of Anglo-Saxon and he, and he knew what he was talking about when it came to the Saxons. And the Rohirrim are uh, basically Saxons on horseback, although of course the, the real Saxons didn't fight mountain. And they are the good guys. Aragon calls them a stern people, loyal to their lord, wise but unlearned. But it's hard to imagine a, a, a Tostig type character among them. But just as many modern people will not have read The Lord of the Rings or seen uh, Peter Jackson's uh, trilogy of movies. Back in the Saxon day, it's by no means certain everyone would have been familiar with Beowulf and the like. And, and even if they were, they might have thought it was, you know, jolly good entertainment, but implausible tush, contrary to their lived experience. And we just don't know. In trying to understand and Tostig's actions and behaviour, it makes more sense to look at the historical and domestic situation in which he 
developed and existed, and then try to determine how aberrant or not he was. Well, so, so who was Tostig? He was born sometime between uh, 1023, 1028, at a time when battles, fights and vendettas over land and clan and personal aggrandizement were the rule, not the exception. Um, Tostig's father was the cunning, clever and ruthless Godwin, son of Wolfnoth. His mother, Gita, was the daughter of a warlike Danish chieftain. Uh, Godwin Sr. hustled his way to the top to be England's go-to hitman and bagman. He was an advisor to the ruthless King Canute, the man who created the uh, English Oldhams in the first place. And after Canute's death, he served uh, Harold Harefoot, uh, Hatha Canute, and the little bit more saintly Edward the Confessor, um, who nevertheless knew all about power. Now, Godwin's royal connections were also enhanced when his daughter Edith became Queen of England after marrying King Edward in uh, 1045. And so Godwin Sr. hustled ever closer to the throne as the new king's father-in-law. Godwin's other sons included the earls uh, Svein, Gift, Leofwein, uh, Wolfnot, and the famed Harold, who was crowned king of England in um, 1066 following the death of King Edward. In the words of the historian N.J. Hyam, Godwin Sr.'s favourite pastime was amassing land, wealth and influence, often at the expense of others, including churches and the king himself. Uh, incidentally, all, all works referred to uh, here are um, contained in the description panel below. There's references uh, going on down there. So, the historian Hugh Bibbs says Godwin Sr. never acted out of patriotic service, only self-interest. He says he benefited from natural leadership ability founded upon an impressive personality and physical courage rather than upon loyalty to others, he writes. Now, Tostig's father was Tostig's role model. He watched his dad at work, and likely assumed that power, ruthlessness, cunning, and violence were the exact traits you needed to make it big in this world, and to a large extent that was true. Um, the old man, uh, Godwin, died at Winchester in 1053, and was buried in the minster there, close to the graves of his old um, bloodthirsty Patrons, Canute and uh, Hat Canute. Now, Tostig's big brother Svein was a fraternal role model, offering lessons uh, to Tostig in kidnap and murder. I won't go into the details here, but briefly in 1046, Svein, uh, for reasons best known to himself, abducted the um, abbess, abbess of Leominster, uh, a crime for which he was uh, sent into exile. And on return, when he got back, Svein murdered his cousin Bayon, who had refused to give back lands he was granted in Svein's absence. In 1051, the entire Godwin clan was sent into exile after Godwin Sr. refused King Edward's order to attack and punish the people of Dover over a dispute with King Edward's brother-in-law, Eustace, who's a Count of uh, Boulogne. Uh, this prompted the observation by one historian that the Godwins upheld the adage that the family that slays together, stays together. Now, to be fair, Tostig at times did show loyalty to the family cause, uh, specifically to big brother Harold. He displayed real bravery and astute military, tactical and command skill 
in 1062-63, when he helped Harold in a successful campaign in Wales against the forces of King Gruffydd. By this time, the, the Godwinsons held lands, goods and property of enormous value, perhaps even greater than that of King Edward himself. As uh, authors Lacey and Danziger say, in the Anglo-Saxon period, the greatest lords were the greatest thugs, for the English aristocracy, like the military elite of every European country, was a cadre that had been trained to kill. To be noble was to wear a sword and to throw your weight around. Now it was by throwing his weight around in the wrong place and with the wrong people that landed Tostig in all kinds of strife and which set him on the course to his ultimate betrayal. In 1055, at the age of around 32, Tostig uh, had been appointed the Earl of Northumbria. It was a big gig, and it wouldn't be easy. Now, this wasn't the Northumbria of today, uh, which is a relatively small council area between the rivers um, Tees and Tweed in northeast England. Tostig's Northumbria was massive. Huge tracts of land north of the Humber, as the name suggests, taking in uh, today's Yorkshire, County Durham, modern Northumbria, uh, lands out to the west, and up to the Scottish border. It was a long way from England's uh, engine room, London and the south, and transport and communications were poor. It was, um, perhaps surprisingly, ethnically and culturally diverse, with a mix of um, Anglo-Saxon peoples and Scandinavians, the Vikings, who had, you know, been raiding and settling from the, what, the 7th, 8th century onwards. Its people were relatively independent, and historically, they had paid little, if any, taxes. Um, his capital, York, uh, uh, whose uh, modern name derives from the uh, Danish uh, Jovik, had uh, deep Viking roots, and still does, um, only really integrating into the Saxon kingdom from about 954 CE. And if you walk around there today, you can see streets, uh, Micklegate, Coppergate, uh, they're all um, Scandinavian, uh, Gata. Gates, Gata, uh, I think it's just a word for street, Copper Gata, Cooper Gata, street of the, the barrel makers. Anyway, it's a diversion. Um, now, these northerners were a tough and stubborn bunch who didn't like to be pushed around. At first, Tostig seemed to take the earldom in his stride, even, even finding the time to uh, swan off and take a then fashionable pilgrimage to Rome. Uh, there was some border incursion trouble in the Cumbria region from his erstwhile uh, Scottish ally, King Malcolm, um, but Tostig took no action. Uh, incidentally, he also uh, um, was acquainted with Macbeth, the, the Macbeth from Shakespeare. And then things started to go wrong. Yeah, as indicated, Tostig was often an absent landlord. He, um, often found reasons to head down south uh, whenever he could. And when he was in Northumbria, he played the tough guy, uh, raising taxes, introducing harsh laws, stealing land and um, interfering with local customs. Two thanes who called on him to protest were killed by some of Tostig's henchmen, and more violence followed after that. Um, as the historian Edward Augustus Freeman puts it, it is clear that his government had by this time degenerated into an insupport insupportable tyranny. This, he says, is not uncommonly the case with men of his disposition, harsh, obstinate and impatient of opposition. Anyway, the people they'd had enough and rose in revolt. They raided uh, Tostig's treasury and armory in York. They made off with his weapons and um, his cash. They wanted 
Tostig removed as well, or else. And then United and the two young Mercian uh, nobles, Morcar and Edwin, who pop up uh, again later um, uh, at the Battle of uh, Fulford Gate, leading the Saxon um, forces there. Anyway, uh, they, and they march south, torching towns and pastures along the way. Tostig had fled down south, and it was big bro Harold who was left to sort out the mess. The rebels demanded that Tostig be removed and banished. Harold was in charge of negotiations, and it was tricky. If he rejected their demands, an unpredictable and bloody civil war of big proportions appeared likely. He saw an alternative but to give in to the demands of the rebels. So they got a new earl, Mokar, and a restoration of the old laws that existed prior to Tostig's rule. On November 1, 1065, Tostig, his family, and some loyal thanes, sulking and depressed, sailed to exile in Flanders to the court of his father-in-law, Count Baldwin. Here, Tostig would brood and plot vengeance. Just a few weeks later, King Edward died and uh, Brother Harold was crowned king. And Tostig set about launching his reprisals. What would his dad have done? What would old man Godwin have got up to? Well, one thing's for sure, the old man wouldn't have taken it lying down. He would strike back and reclaim what was rightly his and woe betide anyone who got in his way. And that's what Tostig attempted to do, albeit somewhat haphazardly. I'm not going to go into the details of Tostig's um, raiding of the uh, Isle of Wight uh, and then England's south and, and east coast and the eventual alliance um, with the Norwegian Viking Hardrada, I think actually sailed across to, uh, to Norway uh, and spent time in Scotland uh, sealing there. But I think that in his actions, the raiding, the plotting and scheming and the desire to be restored to rank and fortune Tostig was merely enacting what he had learned from his father and his golden boy older brother Harold and the rest of the Godwin clan. You had to fight for the right to rule. The greatest lords were the greatest thugs, right to historians Lacey and Danziger. To be noble was to wear a sword and throw your weight around. I said that Tostig wasn't very good at it. He acted more from outrage, anger and damaged pride than from cool, rational self-interest and calculated compromise. Tostig's disappointment went deep because he had expected Brother Harold to support him in the Northumbrian fracas, right or wrong. And he could not understand any cause for Harold's hesitating so to do, except his being art and part with his enemies, writes the historian Edward Freeman. Tostig did what he did because he was a man of his times and a man of his upbringing. But he let his emotions, rather than rational self-interest, dominate his decision-making, something his dad would never have done. Tostig, of course, I didn't and couldn't know that his actions at uh, Stamford Bridge along with uh, Hadrada would result uh, eventually in Brother Harold's defeat at the um, Battle of Hastings a few weeks later. Who knows? Maybe if he'd lived to see it happen, he would have been happy about that and looked for an opportunity in William's court, and that's probably what Dad would have done. But he wouldn't have messed it up, as surely as Tostig would have done. Thank you for listening. Um, 
If you're interested in uh, history and uh, decision making that shaped it, please consider um, subscribing to our channel and giving us a thumbs up, like. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.